this session. Our next uh, uh, event is the panel discussion on the road forward for MFCM and BSB. And this session, and it is our great pleasure to have a Professor Sankar Shubramanyam from University of California, San Diego to moderate this session. Professor Sankar Shubramanyam is a, one of the most renowned professor uh, of bioengineering, computer science, and engineering cellular mo and molecular medicine. He has conducted exceptional research in the bioinformatics, computational biology, system biology, and medicine. His work has won him uh, several prestigious laureates, including Genome Technologies All-Star Award in 2002. And with, without taking any further time, I invite uh, Prof Professor Sankar Shubramanyam to start the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the introduction. And uh, um, uh, we heard some spectacular talks, and so I, I mean, this is really leading. I mean, Nitesh, in fact, led straight into the panel by mentioning all the important points, salient points, and so therefore I'm going to lead this off. Before we start the discussion, I would like to request uh, Mr. Rahul Mehta. Um, who is instrumental in the creation of the Mehta Family Foundation Center for Engineering and Medicine uh, to um, give a very, very brief introduction following which we will have uh, a panel discussion involving experts. I, as a moderator, I'll be very, very quiet. I'll only post the questions and then uh, say my, I mean, and keep quiet and let everybody who has expertise comment on things. So I'm going to let uh, Rahul begin. By Rahul, I can unshare if you want to share and uh, you can um, uh, start the uh, proceedings for the panel. Yeah. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to talk. Uh, I heard Niti's presentation, very impressive, Nitesh. I mean, I'm not sure that, you know, you like you, like Shankar said, you know, you set the stage for what is the future for engineering in medicine. Um, I think, you know, one of the, um, so let me even start with a similar example. So here is this machine called tonometer. I don't know how many of you have seen it or know about it, right? If you think about it, <clears throat> glaucoma is one of the leading cause of blindness around the world. It, <clears throat> right, I mean, India has got a lot of diabetes. Most people who have diabetes, if they don't manage their blood pressure of the eye, it will lead to blindness. So if you think about this machine, this machine I bought, it cost $3,000 in the US, okay? This is a personal tonometer. And if you, those who are familiar with I will know and that just like you're the human blood pressure, the blood pressure of the eye changes throughout the day. So typically what happens today, the way the medicine works is that you go to, you know, you go to a doctor's office and they do a bunch of things and they measure your eye pressure. Okay, it's a very complex process. Okay, and so they get a point in time and they can tell you whether they've got glaucoma or not, right? But imagine that if you had a, a machine like this that can provide continuous feedback or every time you measure it during the day, evening or night, and you have a blood pressure. So if I take this blood pressure, this medicine, this machine, I put it on my eye, I turn it on, there you go. And it's very simple. I just come here, put it on my eye, and I do a click. And you probably won't see it, but there it is. And there it measured my eye pressure. So, and this is again, I think a crude machine. A much more sophisticated machine can be developed. So I think even a simple machine like this, we can change the lives of the millions of people in India. To me, that is what the Center of Engineering in Medicine should do. How can we develop, right? This is just one aspect of the whole Center for Engineering in Medicine, which is team, okay, the digital aspects. If we can do this, as you can imagine, and this will really change not only in the lives of millions of people in India, but around the world. Nobody's gonna be able to afford $3,000 machines, but can we bring the cost down to 500 rupees? or a thousand rupees or even 10,000 rupees. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, the, the, that is where I think we can make an enormous difference in the world. But how, what does it, what is it going to take to get to this machine? It involves physics. 
it involves biology, it involves computers, it involves electrician, it involves every aspect that IIT Kanpur is famous for. So can we build an interdisciplinary team that can tackle problems like this, right? <clears throat> so this is not about individual research. It is how do we fundamentally create and think about interdisciplinary teams that can change the landscape of the future. And to me, that should be the core value that we should start and think about from the Center for Engineering and Medicine, right? Every project that we take, what is our interdisciplinary team? What problems we are solving? How are we going to make an impact in the world? I think if every one of you could do that, who are going to be part of the Center for Engineering and Medicine, I see a very, very bright future for this whole journey that we're all taking together. Thank you. That's my message. Shankar, over thank to you. you. Thank you, Rahul, for motivating uh, this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, I, I'm going to um, essentially pose, uh, I mean, three questions and to each of these three topics. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, give me a second. Uh, can, uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Thanks. So the panelists are, uh, I mean, uh, Rahul, uh, Nitin, Nitesh, Bushra, Imisha, Jennifer, Amitabha, Santosh, and I'll mo just merely moderate. I want to post, we want to talk about three, discuss three topics, digital medicine, molecular medicine, regenerative medicine. And we, we have, I mean, world experts in these areas. We would like them to present their views as a kind of a blueprint for the Meta Family Center for Engineering and Medicine and for BSPE to think about and consider adopting in the future. We'll begin with digital medicine. I want to pose three challenges and open it up initially to I mean, Nitin and Nitesh. And uh, what are the challenges to data analytics offered by new technologies? In fact, Nitesh already highlighted uh, significant parts of those. What would be your perspective on next generation data analytics? Where do you think the future is going? And looking at a crystal ball, how do you anticipate data playing a role in the future of medicine? I would like you to, I mean, give your opinions or views on these topics, which could help IIT Kanpur think about the future. I will turn it over to Nitin and Nitesh in whichever order you choose. Maybe Nitin, you should start off and Nitesh can opine on this at the point. And then we can then go to the next topic, which will be regenerative medicine. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, molecular medicine followed by regenerative medicine. I will stop sharing and let uh, Nitin uh, comment on this. And let's uh, keep our discussion to, uh, I mean, Nitin and Nitesh, if you can keep it to 10 minutes, uh, then we can have uh, questions from the audience. And the same thing will hold for other three, other two areas. I'll stop sharing and uh, let uh, uh, Nitin comment. Nitin, please. Yeah. Thanks, Professor Subramanian. Um, so uh, with, in the digital uh, medicine domain, um, I think broadly we are looking at uh, two aspects, uh, uh, diagnostics and then also treatment. So not just diagnostic, but also treatment that could be done using algorithms. So, and you pose this question of how we can do the data, like what is the future for data analytics? I think the, one of the fundamental challenges that we will face going forward is the combination of different types of data. So we are looking at diagnostics of say uh, a mental disorder. We want to use brain imaging data. We want to use the, the various sensor data, uh, examples of which we saw in uh, Professor Dakwa's talk. We would want to use uh, the constant behavioral monitoring data using sensors that are that could be there on phones and uh, and even the speech uh, data. So how do we put all these different kinds of data together and build models that can combine this data and make predictions about the the ongoing problems or the the predict the future problems based on these patterns? And uh, I think we would have to take the uh, take the best advances in uh, machine learning uh, and uh, statistical methods along with these different kinds of data to make that happen. In the, on the, on the treatment side, uh, I think the, the, the focus 
the the target is how do we how we can use algorithms to intervene and one of the ways in which one can intervene is through uh, behavioral interventions uh, by providing say automated psychotherapy for psychiatric problems or behavioral problems such as uh, depression or anxiety or sleep problems um and also the interventions that could be uh, based on say electrical stimulation the examples of which we saw in professor thakur's talk um which are also algorithm intensive so how we how do we come up with the right kind of stimulation patterns that would be optimized uh, for each person based on their condition so so that that would also require marrying the data that we obtained from the signals uh, or the sensors uh, that are being put and then using that sensory information to to decide the the stimulation protocols so yeah i think we would have to take the the this would have to involve the computer science the electrical engineers on campus with the uh, biologists and cognitive scientists uh, i'll stop Nitin, here and I, I i think professor akor will yeah. nitin thank you i mean a very very poignant point about uh, the interface between electrical engineers computer scientists physicists and so forth it's a very useful and important point Yeah, Nitesh, I'm going to put post the um, um, slides again just so that to remind you, and uh, I would appreciate if you provide your views on this. So I'll take three minutes to give you two minutes because you 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 have expertise in this topic almost as much or more than any of us. Okay, so when I was a very young faculty and I took a little tiny sabbatical to go to Eli Lilly because I was building large computer models of the heart in those days, and they had a cray. supercomputer and now our cell phone is more powerful than that cray so let's let's break up this whole thing into perhaps three parts one is the hardware and i think just don't worry about it for it just is so astonishing the growth of silicon computing that the cray that you had to go to in one part of the country so that everybody would get it is gone your cell phone is as good the second part nitin mentioned up briefly on in passing is algorithms machine learning and so on and that is getting revolution just about everywhere we have deep learning this or that and that so this is where genius mathematician computer scientist and we are all users and all coming together and i would say third part is data right so data is king so in that's why shankar i want you to talk because i can talk about neural data but you work with genomic data and it's it's plentiful and what do you do with it you could give an example i could say the country like china now through invasive uh, monitoring people get enormous population data of, let's say face recognition so the algorithm is going to be crazily good right so india with its vast population if there are this population population genetics health disease data so it, it could be a huge niche right so i would say hardware important nobody can undermine it don't worry algorithms they already this deep learning algorithm have an exponentially improvement so they get better so data how you get it what do you do with it is increasingly the king so why don't i yield because i talk neuroscience gobbledygook and won't matter so let's go to shankar you say how do you use computing and data in your work right i mean that and i think san diego had one of the first super computing center so you should be able to say and add to what i'm saying so take over shankar but uh, thank you nitesh i will be very brief uh, i mean um, this is some this is a topic very dear to us as uh, nitesh uh, rightly pointed out um I, i see the following challenges uh in thinking about the future of data and i want to specifically focus on how iit kanpur can play a role in this uh the first one is uh, as you all well know uh multi modal measurements are becoming data at multiple scales are becoming available in physiology as nitesh pointed out genomic scale is taking over literally we are getting you know genome sequencing rna sequencing chip sequencing atac sequencing you name it you know you get uh, infinite amounts of uh, data in these things we get data from imaging modalities at multiple scales you know starting from molecular scale all the way up to the scales that nitesh talked about 
we are getting data from various aspects of regenerative medicine. Um, I mean, Jennifer spoke about that. And we're really, I mean, they're used to data. Uh, the consensus thinking in, I, in fact, I uh, work with Google on some of these aspects. Consensus thinking is that you cannot just simply feed all this data into some kind of a black box machine and outcomes knowledge out of that. That is just uh, um, wishful thinking, at least for the next century to come or more. And so this is not going to happen. So how do we bring in uh, marry, I mean, data and deep learning and other learning in the context of biomedicine? This is the fundamental challenge. How do you bring context into picture? And there are many, many areas of learning which are now contextual learning. In fact, we, are, we are, wrote a white paper on contextual learning for Google, which talks about exactly where the context comes into picture. How do we feed that into picture? This is, in my opinion, one of the great unseen challenges. And uh, I mean, there are many young minds in IIT Kanpur. In fact, when I visited last year, I gave a talk. I had about 20 students come and talk to me specifically about this area, uh, how to bring in context into data analytics. And I think this is going to be an incredible challenge. And uh, I mean, think about, I think of this movie called Sleeper, uh, Woody Allen's movie. Some of you may have seen it, where the future of medicine is you, a person goes into a machine and then walks into a machine and out comes every possible digital output. And you're going to see a digital human with all the data, but the data has to be processed in order to say, okay, now, I mean, you've got this, I mean, condition or this is a recommendation for your, I mean, well-being for next healthcare. I mean, recommendation and so forth. So I think really think that challenge is going to lie in how do we deal with the data to knowledge, the transformation, and how do you bring context into picture? Specifically in MFCEM, I think there is a unique opportunity for computer scientists, for people who are in, invested in technology like Nitin, for example, and others, uh, I mean, to really play a role in terms of marrying this technology, data from technology into measurements. I will pause at this point. I don't want to take the time um, I hope, Nitesh, I fulfilled at least a small piece of uh, your expectation in terms of thinking about where the future is going for data analytics. And what I would like to do, I originally thought we'll have a discussion on each topic, but uh, in the interest of time, given that uh, you have been patiently waiting for a long time, let me uh, get to the next two I mean, challenges, and then we are, all the panelists can opine on all the topics that would be a better way of doing it. So I would really like to go to the I mean, next slide, if I may, and uh, discuss the uh, I mean, a, a road towards uh, a road to the future with reference to molecular medicine. As you well know, you know molecular, I mean, scales today, molecules have a different scales. So today we have the ability to look at chromatin in such extraordinary detail. In fact, I don't know how much you look at uh, sheet uh, light microscopy. You can look at chromatin dynamic changes that are going on as a function of transcriptional changes. You know, I mean, this is really spectacular. So this technology is only going to produce more and more data. So the question is, I want to pose these three challenges. What do you think are the key challenges for molecular measurements offered by new biomedical technologies? What is your perspective on bridging the scale to human physiology and pathophysiology? And looking at the crystal ball, um, how do you anticipate molecular medicine play a role in the future of healthcare? I really think that this is a, a key aspect. You know, we're all familiar with therapeutics and so forth. So therefore, I would like to open this to um, uh, Hinesha Belkran, who I have not had the pleasure and privilege of meeting before, and um, uh, Bushra Atik, and uh, Bushra has uh, already commented. And Bushra, maybe you lead off for five minutes, followed by um, uh, Hinesha. So you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, please, uh, please, okay. uh, Bushra. Okay, okay. So uh, again, like uh, what I feel like in a uh, country like India, molecular medicine is very at a uh, nascent stage. And we have different set of challenges, uh, which are more like, you know, for a low and middle income uh, country. But uh, recently with the effort of CSIR uh, funded like a project where they sequenced the genome of 1029 uh, normal healthy individuals. So I think this is a good, uh, like, you know, time, good phase to start on, like, you know, precision medicine or molecular medicine. And uh, just to give you a pointer, like, around 32%, I think, uh, single allele variants are very unique to Indian population. So there are, like, some disparities, which is, like, uh, very specific to our population. And uh, because we are starting new on this, uh, like, you know, on this front, on uh, uh, like, uh, 
uh, molecular medicine, I feel like there are three areas or three prong approach that we should focus on. One is on capacity building because, uh, you know, like uh, our uh, clinicians, they're really overwhelmed because it's a big country. And I think we need to have, uh, like, you know, uh, people like uh, Dr. Beltran, physician scientists that we don't have currently. And I think for that, we have a plan, like, even for uh, MFCM and even, uh, with upcoming School of uh, Medical Sciences at IIT Kanpur. So I think that will bridge up some little bit to have, like, some uh, program where we have joined students who could, like, you know, like uh, uh, MD or MS student would come to IIT Kanpur and do some, like, you know, fundamental research or more uh, translation research. The second thing I think where we uh, kind of have a caveat is uh, uh, even Nitish uh, mentioned, it's like digitalization of medical records, I would say. I think it's very important and especially uh, with obviously with multiple layers of uh, data security and uh, privacy. But I think it's important because we are a very huge country. I think we contribute about 17% to the world population with a lot of diversity. So I think it will it will be really helpful in uh, even uh, uh, having a, some family history for it, rare diseases, integrate some clinical trial like that data, and uh, even data about like, you know, uh, what are the like, you know, allergies and how, what is the role and uh, lifestyle and all all things put together i think it will be a huge impetus for even machine learning uh, that's what i feel and finally like what i feel uh, in a country like india we don't have uh, that many bio repository properly maintained bio repository i would say and i think it's a time to have a digitalized bio repository where you can have a tumor sample or even any uh, a biological sample that could be linked with uh, like you know uh, data coming from this multi omics uh, like you know approaches or pathological records, something like that. So uh, that is my view. And now over to uh, Dr. Bilton. Thank you. I've, I've been finding these discussions really fascinating because it's nice to hear about challenging from challenges from different perspectives. And I think in hearing about sort of all the technology that's advanced in so many ways and what our cell phones can do, um, I think about, you know, in the clinic, um, you know, we're still writing notes with free text. Um, we want to do a, a machine learning um, project looking at pathology images. We have to scan each individual slide. Um, there's nothing, um, uh, we're so behind, I think, in many ways um, in the way, you know, medical information is annotated and available. Uh, we are do we we hire people. Their whole job every day is to just go through medical charts, um, and I think that that needs to be definitely improved. And it's it's surprising that um, we're so far behind compared to other other um, areas of 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 you know other industries and other avenues. And I think about cancer. You know we. Um, we've done, you know, it's a major problem. And I think if we're going to make a big impact on cancer anywhere, we have to learn, you know, obviously how to better treat it, um, but also, you know, how to prevent it. And I think, I do think that in oncology, the future is going to be with all of these technologies, looking at early detection, um, looking at in developing, you know, ways to interrogate. Um, already, we're seeing that with sort of the Grail um, technology, looking at self-free DNA to identify cancer early. Um, and I think that that's, and also the germline space and understanding risk, and that's going to be unique to different areas. And I think um, it is important for every you know country to sort of, in some ways, understand their population to be able to best apply this to be able to maximize pre cancer prevention strategies. Um, but right now, of course, we're we're kind of already at the late stage and trying to figure out how best to treat it and how do we bring you know chip seek to patients. I mean that's that's a really um, big leap at the moment. Um, and so we can't interrogate patients the way we can in the laboratory or through through tumor samples that are that are accessible and figuring out you know microfluidic devices and different uh, applications to bodily fluids. I mean, I think these are all going to be really important in moving the moving the needle from um, from the laboratory to patients. Um, and then of course, you know, we're just, um, we, we still need to invest in basic research. Um, I think that there's still so much to learn um, and we're still, but the technologies have been able to, you know, really advance both sides of it. Um, and I think that even the stuff that you can do in the lab for target discovery didn't exist, um, you know, not that long ago. So 
um, it's kind of my overall big picture, but I think very aligned with some of the, the talks in other in other applications, but I think um, medicine is still, uh, there's still a lot of gaps into trying to integrate. Sorry, I was muted. Th th thank you, Himisha and Bushra. I mean, really, I mean, good, good thinking. I just want to make a couple of points uh, before we go to move to the next topic and then we'll have the discussion. Number one, I mean, I think uh, the real challenges uh, come about as uh, are highlighted by my discussions with EPIC. I, many of you know that EPIC is uh, one of the mammoth um, health, electronic health record systems in the United States. It is used by 70% of the medical institutions in the country. And their major challenge is, you know, today there is increasing molecular measurements uh, from human samples, you know, bio samples, uh, be it, uh, I mean, blood, urine, saliva, feces, or tissues. There are gazillion measurements, everything ranging from what uh, Himisha pointed out in terms of doing uh, genomic type or molecular type measurements all the way up to large scale measurements. EPIC does not know how to even think about handling these things. You know, I mean, this is one of the key issues and we, I, and Himisha mentioned this, how do we translate your molecular understanding into phenotypic biomedicine? This is in fact, to me, the foremost challenge that comes about. You want, for example, if I make measurements of metabolites, uh, which is fairly straightforward today, I can do, I mean, a thousand metabolites. If I go to a company like Metabolon and give a blood sample, they can do thousand metabolite measurements on a, you can do it longitudinally. How do I know what these metabolites imply for human physiology? I mean, many of you know that if it's just sugar measurements, I know that if my sugar exceeds 120 decigrams per milliliter, I'm going to say somebody is insulin resistant. But how are all the other myriad metabolites that we are measuring? How can we translate our molecular knowledge into phenotypic medicine? This is, in my opinion, one of the key challenges. The second issue was brought up by Himisha, which is that you know, we have scales of measurements uh, in humans that can only be done ex vivo to a large extent. I mean, we cannot do, I mean, imaging, I mean, mesoscopic scale imaging measurements in human physiology at the scale of, I mean, in a tissue, you cannot penetrate the tissue and make measurements in human physiology in any meaningful scales. How do we make these measurements? What molecular measurements can we make in vivo? I mean, as opposed to, uh, I mean, in situ, as opposed to ex vivo, that's a fundamental challenge. One way of addressing this challenge comes to the next set of discussions and challenges. Can we make organoids of various human tissues? These are avatars or mimics of human tissue, which can then be used in terms of uh, assessing what could be an idealized scenario of a human of a precision medicine human tissue. I mean, responding to either treatments or therapeutics or molecular scales. And so this is the question that we are going to post in the very next discussion topic, which leads us into the challenge of regenerative medicine. I mean, the key questions are, what are the challenges in exploiting stem cell biology? We all know that in two dimension, we can do great stem cell biology. When we go to three dimensions, when we go to, I mean, multicellular stem cell biology, organoid biology, everything goes out of the window. It's extremely complicated. And uh, we get, I mean, we don't know exactly what we get. It's very complicated. How would your perspective on regenerative tissues, let's say, assume we succeed. Engineering is going to play a big role in stem cell engineering. Let's say we do succeed in making tissues at the scale we want to study them. How are we going to analyze them in the context of human physiology and pathophysiology? And looking at the crystal ball, I mean, how do you think that in the future, I mean, I don't anticipate a time in my lifetimes, maybe in your lifetimes it may happen, some of you, I mean, um, artificially regenerated organoid being implanted into a human in some meaningful ways. It's happening, don't, I, I should correct myself, it's happening at the level of musculoskeletal or skeletal cases, but nevertheless, large scale, this is going to be a pretty complex uh, scenario. And I would really like uh, the two, I mean, real phenomenal experts in this or three experts in this, I would like to uh, have Amitabha, Santosh and Jennifer comment on this. Maybe in this time we'll lead off with Jennifer who is one of the world pioneers in this uh, regenerative medicine technologies. And uh, I mean, she she's probably knows more about it than anybody in this room. So Jennifer, I mean, please uh, provide your viewpoints on this point oh. they raised. Thank you, thank you. Very, um, um, very kind words from you. Um, so I think you can tell from my research that I 100% agree with you that we're not gonna have stem cell um, um, or organoid implants. And we've fully redirected to um, 
uh, you know, the immune system and how to engage with that. And um, that's actually allowed us to integrate into these other topics that you're discussing here in, in your three-pronged approach, right? So I never thought that I'd be dealing with big data in the way that we are now and um, doing transfer learning um, to identify cell types, um, specific to cell types within these large data sets and correlate specific cell types with responder, non-responder status in um, cancer immunotherapy trials. So um, I think um, there's a lot of momentum that happened with the stem cells and investment, and um, sometimes that gets you on the wrong track. Um, so I, I agree with you um, that we're not gonna be seeing that um, um, translate. That said, there's still a lot of knowledge that can be gained from the organized systems, uh, basic developmental biology, disease modeling, drug testing, and things like that. Um, but I think the importance of bridging all these fields together is, is critical because clinical translation is what helped redirect us on new therapeutic targets. Right. And, um, you know, we're even now expanding into the nervous system. Right. So, so Nidish, I might call you up for making some devices for stimulating nerves to change immune responses. Right. So it's all connecting. Right. So I, I think um, we can make discrete boxes for different areas of, of, of research, but um, even those are falling down. Mm -hmm. So having some type of um, what I appreciate about what you've put together is the interdisciplinary nature of it, because that's really the key. You have to follow the science, follow the clinic, follow, follow what all of all of science and medicine is telling you without the barriers. And more than that, with the resources of expertise and technology in all these different areas, right? So with our first um, single cell studies, it took really years of talking with colleagues, right? And we were talking different languages, right? And we wanted to work together, but like, we just didn't know how to communicate, right? And so it took many times, many um, dirty chais, Nidish, of talking and talking and talking and talking until we sort of got the same language and could then really be productive together. And I really liked your comment that um, Shankar have just, it's not just about the data. And I think the fact that I, 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 well, I see purely computational groups missing a lot of the biology and medicine, and it just doesn't, you know, that it, it, it doesn't make sense, right? So being able to embed the computational and experimental together really allows, you know, the, the stellar students are the ones that understand the experiments that are going on and the biology that's going on and yet still are doing the computational aspect. Right. So, so that's how you train the best next generation and it's how we get to do the most, you know, fun research. Jennifer, great comments. Uh, very, very, I mean, important comments. And so let me get uh, Amitabha and Santosh to comment and then maybe add a little bit to what you said. Amitabha, please. Yeah, like, um, first of all, I must uh, agree with uh, Professor Thakur and then, you know, when uh, Dr. Elisif is here in the room, that cartilage regeneration is the most important problem. <laughs> <laughs> so if we take I'm very that as, <laughs> so you know, like if we take simply that as a paradigm, and we project that into regenerative medicine, as uh, Jennifer said, that you need to understand the developmental biology of cartilage to figure out how you would try to make a cartilage-like tissue in vitro. Once you have done that. Uh, you would like to uh, collaborate with surgeons to think about how you want to implant it. If you want to study the pathology of osteoarthritis, I do understand that Jennifer has a way of looking at it. Uh, there are other schools of th thoughts as well. And uh, you may uh, want to develop, a, uh, like once you created an assay system for the degeneration, then you may want to develop a drug screening uh, pipeline for, the, uh, for that assay system. Once you have done that, uh, that, that is you know, another genre where you would like to do the drug screening, where you would like to do the drug delivery, and all of that would come under the regenerative medicine uh, ambit, and we can have colleagues uh, there. Like, you know, like what uh, Rahul started off with is that it has to be an interdisciplinary team. 
if you take it another step further, that uh, I know a colleague of mine in the campus, he claims that he had really bad case of osteoarthritis and a friend of his who really understands biomechanics uh, created a prosthesis for him and he thinks that uh, he is getting much more relief. Now cartilage is a uh, 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 you know mechanosensitive tissue, the, so there might be like a, a, a case to it. So uh, uh, we would like to collaborate with uh, good mechanical engineers, good biomedical engineers to come up with the processes and their design and all of that uh, is uh, an, another important aspect to look at. Uh, you take it another step further. Can can we arrest the disease even before it is properly onset? Right now, you. By the time you know that you have osteoarthritis, meaning you have pain, it is already too late. Can we diagnose it much earlier? Can we come up with uh, new kinds of sensors? Can we come up with new kinds of uh, imaging strategies, which will be non-invasive, not really as damaging as X-ray, uh, or uh, you know, like which you can do routinely, which will be affordable. So all of these can be brought together under the umbrella of regenerative medicine and uh, you know like our department has all the right ingredients for it it is just as rahul said that uh, figuring out what are the challenges you want to attack gather the team and uh, you know uh, uh, launch it and i would just like to inform all the, the panelists here some of the mm -hmm. colleagues in the department may know just day before yesterday, our uh, prime minister uh, launched what is called unique digital health ID. So government of India is really pushing to move towards, because we tried and tried very hard to take doctors to the villages and tier two, three towns. We failed. Now the attempt is to take by virtue of technology, healthcare to the villages and tier two, three towns. So that is the reason behind this, you know, creation of the health ID. There is an entire health stack, and you know, uh, I heard uh, Himisha talking about, uh, you know, doctors still using notepads. In India, the problem is even worse because we use so many different languages. So I know that uh, you know efforts are going on to dictate and use. Uh, typed uh, prescription out of a dictation. So there is a, you know, the, like a, a verbal instruction to written instruction uh, uh, conversion and that too uh, uh, using all the 33 different languages. So a lot of these things are happening and when you are part of the ecosystem, stay grounded to the Indian problems and uh, be relevant and we can uh, really attack it as a team. And thank you, Amitabha. Santosh, uh, uh, your uh, brief comments will be appreciated. Yes, sir. Uh, so thanks, thanks for Suleiman. So yeah, uh, so I agree with uh, all all the, all the suggestions and uh, discussions which are happening here. I, I I just want to take one step back and uh, I want to add one more dimension to it. That yes, we can approach a problem, but first we should know what should be the time of approach whether we are too late in approaching the problem and that is creating the more complexity to the problem. So if it is already known or it is somehow provided as information that, okay, this is the time one should go for certain kind of uh, application, then probably that will uh, uh, simplify the problem. So like early detection, so biosensing, that, that is a domain which can help in that direction. So uh, if, if you know it, now how invasive it could be, how destructive it could be, like if biopsy is needed or you can collect some biofluid, even as uh, simple as like tear or sweat, you can find out some biomolecules which could be of interest. So as, as Raul was talking about that, okay, if there is a glaucoma problem, somebody can scan the eye and know the pressure. Same way, there could be a, a biosensing system where just you collect the tear and there, these tears will have biomolecules that by those biomolecules in terms of their type and their uh, concentration ratio, they'll have the information that whether a person is going through what kind of problem and that can be detected and then then it could be much simpler to devise a therapy then uh, as uh, professor dusra said that okay uh, we we want to have a repository but how much uh, amount of tissue would be required if there are uh, 10 or 20 labs once 
to utilize it. So can we plan for non-destructive uh, pathology where you just use the imaging system, which doesn't stain or add the dye to the, uh, uh, to the scan, uh, and then you, you just scan it by uh, maybe Raman imaging, you can do IR imaging, you can find out those patches or areas where there is a chance of cancer and there is change in the chemistry of the molecules which are inside the cell. So that can give information in non-destructive way and you can collect that data. The same tissue sample can be utilized for so many studies by so many groups. So that could be another, uh, another area where, uh, where it can go. Uh, another uh, important uh, thing could be, as Amitabha mentioned, that it's not that all the time health caregiver goes to the patient, but it, it could be mutual. Some information comes as like in form of digital data to the uh, primary center, uh, to, to tertiary centers, and then from there instruction goes to the primary center. And the person who is even of less skill can utilize it and, and work with it, right? So making uh, uh, um, uh, changes which can be handled by even less skilled people, that is also one of the important domain to reach it to the masses. So uh, the two parts of the uh, solving uh, uh, system, that one, where you have less number of problems, but very high complexity. Another could be less complex problems, but mass is such a big number that you cannot uh, entertain both together. So I think a two throng approach uh, might help in, in future. That's what I think. Hey, thank you, Santosh. I, I will quickly get to the audience and especially Dr. Sinha posted a fantastic point and I'll come to that. Before I do that, let me just talk about how these three areas can impact IID Kanpur, CEM, uh, and BSPE. And this was, I mean, my, the Janaki's mandate to me was to distill and synthesize this. So to me, one of the key areas, how can IID Kanpur play a role, a uh, unique role in this area of regenerative medicine? I want to point out a couple of things here. Oh, it's traditionally, IITs are exceptionally strong in engineering, and I came out of IIT Kanpur, so I know that engineering is incredibly strong in IIT Kanpur. The, one of the big challenges today in regenerative medicine, stem cell engineering, is uh, scaling. Is going from the scale of, uh, I mean, a two-dimensional 10 microns, 100 microns kind of scale into millimeters scales, and this is really a huge issue this is an engineering problem. It is not a problem of stem cell biology. It's an engineering problem to get the right forces, to get the right uh, environment, to, to right, get the matrix. And so this is a fundamental challenge. And this is still all over the world. It's a huge challenge. So ID Kanpur can play a big role in terms of training people to think about the interface between engineering and biology at this level. And a company and companion challenge is the following. In addition to this notion of uh, making scales, you want to look at what is the interface between non-living matter and living matter. In fact, Jennifer is one of the world experts in this in terms of biomaterials. You can synthesize biomaterials extraneously. You can make lots of biomaterials, gels, hydrogels, and so forth. How exactly can you design something that will mimic the real, I mean, a human environment, tissue environment? This is an engineering challenge. It is not so much a biology challenge alone. And so this is another area where IIT Kanpur can play a huge role. I know they have a good material science department or material science program. So this could be a fundamentally interesting thing for you to think about. So these are two things where I thought in regenerative medicine area, IIT Kanpur, MFCEM can play an important role. Um, along with, of course, with the digital medicine and molecular medicine we spoke about. I want to now turn it over to the audience. Before that, I want to comment on Dr. Pradeep Sinha's uh, comment on the chat box. I think, uh, Pradeep, you brought up a fantastically important point. Uh, how do we, we may think about use-inspired research. At, I'm reading your statement. A novel direction for research, innovation, takes root of the IID system. How do we train students? I'm paraphrasing you. How do we do translate this to education and research in terms of getting the students? I know that it's, it's going to be beyond the scope of a 15-minute panel discussion that we have left, but I would like IID Kanpur, the uh, faculty in IIT Kanpur, BSPE, to engage I mean, people like you know, Nitesh and Jennifer and uh, Himisha and others in terms of really posing this fundamental question. We can have an extended discussion exclusively on how to translate this into education 
and how, what are the best modalities by which we can train the next generation workforce and students who are going to be pioneers in these cutting edge areas of precision medicine. And so, um, Pradeep, thank you for bringing it up. And um, uh, I really think you hit the nail upon the head. I would like the panelists to comment on that, but before that, I want to make one more comment from Ravi Pandey, uh, who said that uh, data analytics has a great role to play in precision medicine in making use of information important because it takes several years for medicine to go from clinical trials to public domain. Information is available in clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, registry can be used effectively for human benefits. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Ravi, for mentioning that. So I would like to now very quickly turn to the panelists, uh, any of you, I mean, who want to opine on the educational component, how do we bring in education into this next generation thinking on the road forward with these three areas? Nitesh, maybe you want to lead off your, I mean, always, um, I mean, your expert opinions on education. <laughs> uh, put, you're putting me on the spot. But uh, um, as you said, there is an IIT brand and it's because of JE or how the selection occurs. So top best students go on to do great things. And so uh, perhaps for BSB in Kanpur is how do you make your division most attractive for the top ranked students. And uh, at Hopkins and Jennifer can also elaborate that's what BME at Johns Hopkins did. For whatever things that we did right, uh, it's ranking, the, the charisma of the field, the research, whatever attracted the best students. Now we are doing conscientious enough a job to teach them as well as we can. So, to, because we can philosophize about educational methods. So I just want to leave you with one thought that make BSB, oh, and, and of course, School of Bi Biosciences, IIT Bombay, I have to be parochial, as the best places for the top ranked students, for better or worse, that's how they are, right? That's how the educational system in India works, that they have to go through JE and Gates. So because of that, attract the best, but make your field attractive, right? Make yourself attractive, the, make yourself knowledgeable to all these young people so that they say, oh, I want to go to Bombay or Kanpur and I want to not click on computer science, but I want to click on BSB as the best. And then things will take care of itself. So let me leave, stop there for giving other people a chance to, maybe Jennifer can say in her why BME at Hopkins is attractive or top. And in fact, in general, biomedical engineering compared to other, all other engineering has transcended. So maybe I can hand over to Jennifer. Uh, thanks, Nanesh. I, I would just comment that I feel that the students are the glue that hold the interdisciplinary projects together, right? So they're growing up and learning and working in both fields in a way that um, faculty can't. And so, you know, when we're looking at, you know, getting into new immunology, getting into new computational things, new data science or new systems biology, it's the students who serve as that joint vehicle that are co-mentored by those experts in sort of those two orthogonal fields. And so that not only provides them with a very unique educational background, but they're really the only ones that can do that, really that are working with these two experts and, and putting the two fields together. So I think that's what allows you to be leading edge in interdisciplinary work is having the ability for this, the students to, to actually be able to connect um, faculty and research fields together. Thank you, Jennifer. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. You know, it is uh, uh, especially the young generation who is familiar with all these multifaceted things uh, all the way from computation to, I mean, hardcore sciences, they are the ones who are going to make a difference. The young Turks, so this makes complete sense. Uh, Himisha, do you have uh, comments to make on this? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think that 
um, having opportunities to immerse yourself in a discipline that is maybe not your primary focus can help um, students at a very early stage come up with innovative ideas and actually fresh ideas to drive the field. And I think that, you know, when I was a student, which is a long time ago, you know, it was the field was very different. And I think people when you're young, you tend to be highly focused on wanting to be successful in the area that you're studying. Um, but to to realize that that you know, opportunity to go to another lab or to work with another mentor may seem off track, but it actually will help in the long run. Um, I'm actually surprised how few, you know, here, how few clinicians go into the lab and how few scientists go to the clinic, you know, um, and that's just one example, but I think that works for every discipline is that the incentive for students to be successful is maybe driven on your publications or something else, but not necessarily on how much you're learning uh, during the process. Thank you, Amisha. I would really like to request uh, Sankar, who is uh, the chair of uh, BSBE, uh, since uh, he's uh, spearheading this whole effort. What are your views in terms of, I mean, would you like to comment on uh, the issues that uh, you brought up? I am, I am very glad that this topic came up for discussion because I am uh, working on a computational biology project and it's really difficult to get students uh, who are ready to work in this kind of uh, area because most of our applications, they come from embassy biotechnology or BTEC biotechnology or traditional biology background. So my first task, actually they are excellent uh, students, but they don't know uh, what the problem is. So they don't know like how computational approaches can help in tackling the biological problem. So you have to first educate them. As uh, I think Jennifer or uh, others correctly mentioned, they are ready to learn. They can learn very easily. So that way, I would say that uh, the, the supervisor, the PI has the big responsibility first to convince them that it, this is what uh, you know, uh, these two fields can can do when they come together and the student should have the motivation to learn. If the student doesn't have the motivation, student has some mental block that, you know, I cannot write computer code, I cannot work on computer program, then, you know, you can do, you cannot do anything. So the, mo the most important responsibility is, is the allies with the PI who should make the student to have to just who should generate interest and the students uh, should be convinced and I think then there is no looking back. So uh, that combination, the student coming from a different background and working uh, you know, on a problem which is kind of different and the student can learn both disciplines. They can learn quickly and they can interact with the other students working in the field. And uh, in IIT setup, the students interact, they, they go for coffee, they you know, uh, interact in their uh, residence halls. So I, that part, you, once the student is convinced, the student can go all the way to learn anything. So I feel that this is achievable, but the PI should you know, initially should play a big role. In, in convincing the student that uh, you know this is how you should do it and it is uh, doable Just, and the student always has you know probably sometimes they are not very confident that they can actually write codes in my case it can be a mechanical engineering problem or electrical engineering problem but you should instill confidence with on you know the student and they can they will be able to do but so once the student has motivation, has confidence, the student can do it, and that I feel is the is this will that will uh, you know uh, become a successful outcome of the interdisciplinary project. Thank you, Sankar. Santosh, you raised your hand. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to add that many many of the times students when they reach to the lab. Uh, before that, their training or uh, when they were aspiring for that position, they, they, they trained themselves in an entirely different way. So the, the procedure, the, the syllabus, whatever they do, they use or 
they get trained on for uh, qualifying that com uh, competitive exam, that is entirely a different set of information, which they collect and then they give it in the exam, they get good rank, then they reach uh, uh, to a lab and then they see that, okay, well, uh, it's entirely different game. So they are, they are very inhibitive about it that, okay, they, because they do not know what would be the future of that field. I never knew about it. This is an entirely new set of information. So though in our system, we provide this summer internship to bachelors, masters, but not to high school students. So now they have started some utter uh, tinkering labs and all these procedures are coming, but still there is a, a lot of scope. If we catch them young, then probably uh, they'll be convinced that, okay, when they are reaching to the site where they can perform, yeah, this field has a role or this field can take me uh, a long distance. So I think that could be one of the intervention can be uh, done. And, and I think the field is moving in that direction. It might take some time, but that has to be happening. So yeah, that's what I mean. Thank, thank you, Santosh. I think these are all extremely important points. Uh, we, I believe we have something like six minutes or so left uh, for our discussions. And so I would like uh, to get Rahul to make a, co a comment. But before I do that, I just want to say one thing. I mean, we have been faced with this challenge as well in terms of reimagining education. Standard curriculum, like just teaching engineering separately and physiology separately, biology separately, is not a solution, not scalable. We are not going to see the future in terms of teaching 25 courses uh, for students before they even learn how to talk to each other. That's not going to happen. So we need to reimagine, we as uh, faculty who are teaching, need to reimagine how we are going to teach a next generation course, integrating, I mean, significant engineering, computation, biology, and technology into the force, into fray. This is a challenge that all of us have to face. I don't see an escape from this. <clears throat> we started doing this. In fact, I offered a systems medicine course last uh, year for graduate students, which integrated all of these things. And uh, it was really received in a way that I was unexpected, that it was unexpected. So therefore, I think we have to reimagine how we are thinking about uh, our curriculum. But that's just a topic for some other discussion with IID Kanpur. Uh, Rahul, you want to make some comments? Uh, you are uh, the pioneer in terms of starting this uh, CEM. You are muted, Rahul. I was going to say, well, thank you. I mean, you know, it has been a very fabulous discussion, obviously. I mean, it's learned a lot. Um, now, my comment is going to be very simple, which is, I think to me, I think there are two components that we are discussing. One is the educational component and one is the research component, right? I mean, I think from an educational component, you know, I totally agree that we have to reimagine education. How do we fundamentally think about new course curriculum, new courses that we teach to students, and how do we actually expose the students at the, even at a freshman level to understand, you know, what these interdisciplinary things are all about in the future. Obviously, the second thing is that we have to update all our websites. We think about the, where the source of all the information is. Most IIT's website is all very, what I would call is not consumer friendly. You know, it is very, uh, very, very, static. Uh, so how do you fundamentally, even if you want to educate the new set of children and get them understanding what life is all about, we have to actually give them a better information as to what their future is if they actually were to take a field like this into their life. Okay. Otherwise, they're by default, an Indian student's answer is, let me go to computer science because they see Infosys and making money. I think we have to really do a great job of educating uh, the future of these things on different media forms so that they can understand where the light, you know, what kind of a future is possible. And I think on the research side, I think my comment would be, how do we, you know, right? It's really about, you know, how do we understand? We all look at the Western world a lot of times and says, Western world is doing A, so that is very sexy. I'm going to do B because that is very sexy or C, which is very sexy. I think the reality is that I think we have to think about what is the Indian problem that I'm going to solve? How am I going to, what is the focus, right? Because you cannot, you do not have the resources, right? With 25 students or with even 25 faculty members and 100 students, what can be realistically achieved within the next five years? How do you really build a, a good strategic vision 
which maps that, I think becomes a very good exercise to go through. And that is ultimately what's gonna give you the reputation, which is gonna give you the success, which ultimately can allow you to grow into a larger, larger group. But if you don't even have a focus, you don't even have these things, I think it will let, become very diffused. And I think one of the challenges I see is that how do we really build a good focus? And I think we have all the panelists here who can help actually help you. I think they can tell you where the Western world is, but I think they all understand where the East Indian world is. And I think if we actually have a very good session, strategic planning session on where the Center for Engineering and Medicine should go, I think we can, you know, you got really have all the great people here. I mean, I'm not the domain expert, so I cannot help you in that area. But I think these are the domain experts that can guide you very well. So that's my thoughts. Thank you, Rahul. Um, um, I think uh, uh, I think it's Nitesh who uh, sent this, or Nitin, I forget. I mean, I can't get the whole thing here. Uh, we are too academic about this topic. Young, bright minds are attracted to great talk because pizza is served. Or more seriously, reputation of the teacher, grades, website, etc. I suggest becoming very practical here to attract the best. Then only they can overcome, they come over to serve dirty chai, a metaphor for something new and enjoyable. Uh, added scholarship dollars, you know, it, don't underrate. We're being very nerdy, academic, preaching to all gray haired people, preaching to the choir. And if you think about a 18 year old, it's gonna come because of ranking, uh, scholarship dollars. Yeah. Really, really cool website. They heard a crazy, beautiful talk and said, well, artificial art, brain, cartilage. So, you know, I think um, that's what I'm kind of pointing to. And, you know, at the very least, start with scholarship dollars and stuff. I think your, your talk, Nitish, your talk should be on the website. I think it would talk about Star Wars. I think it will drive a lot of people here. Yeah, I would uh, love, I mean, this has been a fantastic uh, panel discussion from uh, experts like, you know, I mean, uh, Nitish, uh, uh, Jennifer, Himisha, and everybody from ID Kanpur. So I think you should, uh, I mean, uh, utilize this uh, down the road towards, uh, I mean, figuring out what are the strategic things where uh, CEM can be the world leader in terms of uh, pioneering and uh, paving the way for the future. So I hope uh, we have been helpful to you in terms of thinking about these issues and, uh, um, I want to, it's a, we are the um, exact uh, Cinderella hour of 8 a.m., uh, my time, 8.30 p.m. Indian time. All of you have been patiently waiting for a whole day of great talks. And so I would like to, I mean, uh, uh, pause, thank uh, uh, Jonaki and Amitabha for inviting us to have this panel. Uh, hopefully it was uh, beneficial. We'll do more so in the future. And uh, I would strongly urge uh, IIT Kanpur to keep all these folks like you know, Nitesh, Jennifer, and Himisha engaged with you down the road. Uh, this will be fantastically beneficial to uh, CEM at various levels. So um, with that, I would like to thank all the panelists, thank all the audience, thank Rahul, I mean, for his uh, inspiring work and uh, thank everyone else. And uh, this is great and I appreciate it. And over to you, Janaki, and uh, you're the host. Yeah, while Janaki takes over, Shankar, I must thank you. You must have gotten up at 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m. to host the, do this moderation. It was 7 a.m. at your place when it started. No, no, I usually am up at 5.30 a.m., so it's not a problem. But uh, the point was that it was, uh, I unfortunately missed uh, Jennifer's talk and Himisha's talk. I really wanted to listen. Hopefully you have recorded it and I will listen to it as we go along. And you know, this is not a pro it's been a pleasure, I mean, participating. This time difference of four and a half thank hours. Is, yeah, thank yeah, you, all yes, the so colleagues. Yeah. yeah, I would like to thank everyone who has participated in this wonderful panel discussion. It was very uh, stimulating and uh, thought provoking, and we came up with so many ideas. And we really have a lot of work to do in future to put these into practice. And hopefully this will spark a lot of uh, further interactions that we'll continue to have over time. And then we will build a roadmap for us to follow and uh, how we will you know, make the MFCM a really successful uh, place where research is going on at the interface of engineering and medicine. 
So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, all the speakers, Jennifer, Himisha, and uh, Nitish, for joining us and staying with us for such a long time and discussing everything uh, with us. And all my colleagues for also joining in and uh, all the audience for attending and providing your comments, which will all be very valuable for us. So with that, I would like to say goodbye. And hopefully we will meet again in the near future, maybe in person, which would be really nice. Which would be really nice. So I really look forward to that and uh, many more chances to interact with all of you. So good night from us, maybe good morning from your side. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank Have you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, bye -bye. Nice interacting. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you thank you, Nitish. Hey, thank you, Shankar, and everybody at IIT. Thanks, Rahul. Thank you. Bye-bye, Rahul. Thank you. Bye, Shankar.